Dear people of God who are free indeed because you believe in Jesus who sets you free. Amen. If we really could do like a a much better job of keeping the first commandment, we would also then just like automatically keep all the rest of the other commandments that God has given us that we're talking about this morning. How can that be? If we really did believe in love, honor, and trust God above all else, everything else that God says would just line up and fall into place automatically almost because that first most important thing, worship of the true God, would be where it ought to be. What is God anyway? We we talk about God all the time, but as a concept, what is a God? A God is that upon which you rely for everything. When life is difficult, when you're feeling burdened, when you're hard pressed, where do you flee to find comfort and solace? Where is your hope for the future to be found? A God is that in which you place your full and complete trust and confidence. So, to the people of Israel before us, the Lord God says to to us too, I am the Lord, your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. Now, being the source of deliverance and the source of quite literally everything else, The I am who I am then says that we aren't supposed to make any idol in any form of anything that that we can see out of whatever it is that the earth has to offer. We're not supposed to take anything or person or idea and turn that into an idol and allow it to supplant God. But, but making idols out of all kinds of stuff is really exactly just like what we do as a matter of habit, don't we? And then we allow those things to take God's place, which doesn't mean that I suspect that you have in your house a room uh, filled with shrines and and statues and stuff uh, representing false deities that you you go home and you close the door so nobody can see you doing this stuff and and you bow down and and pay homage and worship these things and that you pray to these lumps of whatever it is. I don't think that's what you do. But because I'm a person, I know we do this we allow all sorts of things to take the place of the true God and we end up worshiping them with the result that the rest of the commandments become impossible for us to keep because how in the world are we gonna do anything else God ever said when that first thing is an improper place? When we allow something to just be in our hearts and linger and fester, when we don't address that stuff and we don't put them away, We are constantly starting off on the wrong foot. We are all guilty of this. So all of us must identify what our idols are. Repent of worshiping them and get rid of them, which is exactly what God told the children of Israel next. He said, you shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Idols can be, and so regularly are, our families, kids. You're not bowing down to your children and praying to them, but we certainly worship them just a whole lot, don't we? We worship the things our kids do or the things that we do, like sports. My goodness, both those we participate in and those we spectate 
Have you seen anybody get as jazzed up about what happens in a close uh, basketball or football game or something as when there's a real line drive of a sermon or something that's being preached? I've never seen anybody jump out of their chairs in church before because they were so excited about what was being said. But this happens all the time when we watch sports. Maybe it's not this stuff. Maybe it's your work, your job, your career, advancement, constantly climbing the ladder, right? Maybe it's physical fitness, coming to believe that your body is not just a temple of the Holy Spirit, but a, but a temple of who you are and ought to be worshiped. So you pursue that, which can honestly create a whole bunch of mental complexes that aren't healthy for anybody. So maybe you're hyper aware of that. Maybe you do the exact opposite thing and you flee stressors at all and you pursue leisure to the degree that leisure has become your God. Speaking of escape, maybe you try to escape reality in a substance like alcohol it's a pretty popular one. Rather than face life's issues, you can find release in the bottom of a bottle. Works pretty well, doesn't it? It's a common one among us. Or this, societally, phones, and the content, the good, the bad, and the ugly that we consume and that we create through these things. Where does your mind go? What occupies your attentions all the time? things we can see here, certainly. Maybe it's this, the land in which we live, which to God looks just like this, right? Lines on a map. We certainly worship this place too. And maybe more specifically, and here we are in an election year, maybe you worship one of the two major parties and their political platform in our nation. People are going to get upset. Odds are, it's not because maybe they heard something a little bit wonky in a sermon that doesn't ring quite true to what they've heard. They'll broach that issue with a brother or sister in the Lord very cordially. But if somebody's political sensibilities are challenged, the armor goes up, the level of rage increases, and reveals what your God is. Maybe it's just looking at yourself in the mirror and having way too much admiration for yourself and therefore, because you are who you are, diving headlong into the, into the cravings and the lusts of your heart and gratifying them so that you become your God. We are all guilty of worshiping all kinds of things that aren't the true God and how sad that is, right? Think of who our God is. He loves us. He saves us. He actually tells us to pray to him and then when we do pray to him, he listens to our prayers and he answers them in a way that is far better than anything we can even imagine. All these other things cannot do that. But in our ravenous pursuit of them, sometimes at the expense of everything or seemingly everyone else in our lives, we display by what we do our belief and our hope that the idols we create can answer our prayers, can deliver, but they can't. God delivers. God delivers from sin. God delivers in all the other ways too. And that's the very first thing he told the children of Israel when he was giving them these 10 commandments that I, the Lord, your God, the God of promise, make good on everything that I say, which is why you are here free, no longer in the land of slavery, no longer in Egypt. I led you out on a mighty outstretched arm. I whisked you away from slavery as though on eagle's wings. And because I have done this incredibly merciful thing for you. You now, my people, are to do these things that I'm telling you to do. And when you do them, you will be blessed. God has done an incredibly gracious thing 
for Israel by giving them freedom. And when he explains that, he's also explaining to them and giving them every single reason that there could possibly be for doing what God has told them to do. And isn't it exactly the same for us here and now? It absolutely is. So worship the Lord your God and serve him only. How so? First, just by recognizing God for who he is, that he is the one true, the only real living God. All these other things are fabrications. God has all the power. God has all the grace. God's uh, excellence surpasses everything else. You worship God by relying on his love and his saving grace for the forgiveness of your sins. You worship God by believing in Jesus, who is your perfection, your substitute, who lived for you, who suffered for you, who poured out his lifeblood to wash you and purify you, who died in your place so that your sins would be forgiven. His death, his suffering, That's the price of our failure to be holy as God has called us to be, but his suffering, his death, that's also the price of our deliverance, slavery to sin and its wage of death. God has redeemed you. So praise God's name and give him the glory that he deserves in scripture leads us in that work, giving us all sorts of excellent things to say, to echo, to praise God's name like this from Psalm 96. Sing to the Lord, praise his name, proclaim his salvation day after day. Ascribe to the Lord the glory, do his name, which is what the people did in the Old Testament. And then all the way at the very end of the Bible in John's vision of Revelation, the saints in glory are doing the exact same thing. Worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Everything that Jesus is worthy of, his his God status, his the business he conducts as savior is all yours by faith, which is what Paul says to the Romans. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. The death of Jesus and what that means for your worship of God, not just here and now in these walls, in this hour, but for your life, with how you worship God with your words, with your actions is so beautifully explained in Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live now in the body, I live by faith in the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You worship God with your mind, your heart, your hands, your whole self by giving your whole self to God as a living sacrifice. You are able to never stop worshiping God by the manner in which you live. Living by faith in the Son of God who loved you, who gave himself for you looks like doing what Jesus says to do in love for him, which is exactly what Jesus says. Matthew 22, Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love glorifies and worships God with everything that you have and are. Love honors your neighbor as yourself and in doing so keeps all the commands that God has given about them. Now in this endeavor, worshiping God, loving neighbor, which keeps the law, the law itself, and in particular, these 10 commandments that we're talking about this morning are not your master. You don't need to be afraid of them. 
because the law, since Christ fulfilled it for you, the law is your servant. The law is your guide. Do these things not because the law rules over you tyrannically. It doesn't. But because God has set your heart free and running in the path of his commands, doing the things that he loves is how you communicate love to God and love to your neighbor. In the vast majority of the interactions that we have with one another, we are also presented by God with opportunities to worship him by how we treat other people, by how we deal with them, which is why seven of these 10 commandments are geared toward our interactions with other people. So we're gonna run through them, but it'll be quick. Don't worry, which is a sin. So don't do that. First, have no other gods. Love, trust, and rely on the one true Lord for everything, especially deliverance from sin and salvation and eternal life. Second, never attach God's name to sinful aims. He tells us very clearly that he won't hold anyone guiltless who does this. Instead, use God's name to pray, to praise him, to ask God to to bless you, yourself, your loved ones, your friends, or perfect strangers too. Third, find rest in God's word. Make the taking of time to be in the word, to gather with other Christians, to praise his name, a true priority, to hear the gospel which gives you peace by assuring you of salvation in Jesus. Fourth, honor those who are in positions of authority over you. And if you are a person who is in a position or positions of authority, do your level best to be worthy of honor, never assuming that you are, and never for even an instant insisting upon its reception. Fifth, love life, keeping even hateful thoughts far from your heart, since God makes it clear that those who hate their sisters and their brothers are in fact murderers. Do what you can to care for human life before and after people are born too, and leave the question of, well, are they worthy of my care? Completely out of your thinking, because they aren't. Nobody is. You aren't either, neither am I. And yet God showers us with mercies every single day, all the time, so that we might turn right around and be merciful to others and love them and care for them according to their needs. Sixth, Be pure, without even a hint of sexual immorality being present in thought, word, or deed. Why? Well, God tells us so, first of all, so that's why. But also because God has told us that he has made our bodies his temples and that the Lord Jesus lives in us. So let us not attach Christ to any sort of sexual sin. Keeping this commandment also avoids major, major guilt, which can last a lifetime. And that is a very real blessing of obedience. Seventh, don't just like not steal people's stuff, but don't deceive people in order to con them out of their things. Don't confuse people by what you say or in uh, contractually, right, in the fine print. Don't make that deceiving. Instead, help them continue to have and keep on improving what is theirs. Eighth, be honest in your relationships and your communications with other people. Take their words and their actions in the kindest possible way. When people start talking trash about somebody else, which happens as a matter of reflex, just like all the time, defend that person. Flee from gossip and say only what is useful for building that person up according to their needs so that it benefits everybody else who listens. Ninth and 10th, keep sinful desires in check. Just go ahead and eliminate them altogether and be content with what God's given finding the ability in Jesus' strength, which is at work in you so powerfully. In general, 
you can boil all of this down to say, worship the Lord your God and serve him only by believing in Jesus as your savior from sin, by carrying each other's burdens. And in doing so, you will fulfill the law of Christ. Worship God by looking after the most vulnerable in their distress. And James tells us that this is the religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless. And we are gonna fail at this. We have already a whole bunch of times and we will again. When we do, the God that you love, the God that you praise, the God that you worship with your whole self remains true to himself and his nature and forgives 1,000 times over because where our sin increased, God's grace in Jesus increases all the more. Amen. Thanks so much for worshiping with us today. We hope that God's word has strengthened your faith. To help us know more about the reach of our efforts here at Monov, we hope that you'll like and subscribe to our YouTube and Facebook pages, and that you also sign our online friendship register to let us know that you're listening today. God bless and keep you.